how subjectivities are negotiated within and adapted to the historical and social circumstance in which women and other subordinate individuals, transsexuals for example, find themselves. Such knowledge is empowering because it transforms disabling fictions into enabling fictions, altering our relationship to the present and often to the past. This activity is significant since those in power can and often do dominate and manipulate memory to serve their own ends. Thus women, ethnic minorities, racialized individuals, and other marginalized groups need to assert their presence in masculinist, hegemonic memory and history. Memories of the past resonate in the hearts of immigrants and shadow their present. Cultural memories emerge out of a complex dynamic between the past and the present, the individual and the collective, the public and the private, between remembrance and mission, power and powerlessness, history and myth. Memories are acts of performance, representation and interpretation that require agents of transfer. Immigrants from India in Canada transfer stories of home and homeland to their listeners and readers, but they do so within a historical and social context that is imbued with race, class, and gender hierarchies. I remember a lecture that I gave as part of the later life learning series at the University of Toronto. The program's theme in 2001 was India, and I was invited to lecture on women in India. When I walked into New College at the University of Toronto, the venue for the talk, I found the entrance hallway full of senior citizens, sitting or standing, talking or reading, looking relaxed and happy. Right across from the doorway, two women sat at a table, ticking off the names of their attendees on a sheet. When I walked towards them, they smiled genially, and before I could say a word, they handed me my name tag. Since I was a few minutes early, I moved on one side. Looking around casually, I noticed that I was the only Indian in that exclusively white gathering. When I caught the eye of some man or woman, they smiled pleasantly and kindly at me. My skin color was a sure giveaway that I was the guest speaker. As we entered the auditorium, I stood behind the podium at the front and noticed that there were approximately 200 men and women in the audience. The audience listened attentively and seemed to find the talk interesting enough. After my lecture, a man asked, is it not true that Indian women are slaves to their husbands? He went on to elaborate that Indian women were required to serve their husbands and families. The question posed a dilemma. How to perform my ethnicity to this white audience? The answer that sprang immediately to my mind was that all cultures and religions are patriarchal but they differ from each other in the degree and extent of oppressiveness. Yet, where to locate Indian gender norms in this continuum? I wondered 
which ideal society the man had in mind in asking this question. Besides, it was not clear whether the question referred to women in India, women in Canada, or in the diaspora. I had the option of celebrating the achievements of some exceptional women in India, or adopting a critical stance towards the oppressiveness of gender norms in India, or copying out completely by giving a vague and general answer. The, man question, the man's questions had also evoked a whole set of memories of women, my grandmother, aunts, cousins, maids, who had been part of my everyday life. I imagine, however, that over the years, the audience had read accounts in Canadian and American newspapers or watched television programs on the Indian cultural practice of arranged marriages and dowry. Somehow, everyone's fascinated by these two topics. The stories portray these cultural practices as uniquely, also, bizarrely, outdatedly, and oppressively Indian. These accounts describe such practices in an ahistorical way and without distinguishing between the traditional and current norms, cities and villages, or India and the diaspora. Arranged marriages are contrasted with our practices of freely entered heterosexual relations between consenting adults. Newspaper reports on what is termed dowry deaths, that is when a young woman is killed by greedy in-laws for insufficient dowry, reinforce images of traditional and oppressive cultures. The stories are accounts of exceptional and sensational cases, yet they become the imagined norm, defining Indian culture as a homogenous whole without any consideration given to religion, caste, class, and myriad other factors. These stories etch pre-existing images of the victimized womanhood of India more deeply in the minds of white Canadians. Experiences such as mine reveal the subtle and invisible nature of everyday racism. Everyday racism involves systematic, recurrent, and familiar practices that can be generalized and which involved socialized attitudes and behavior. Reconstruction of events such as mine, whether verbal or written, provide the best basis for the analysis of the simultaneous impact of racism in different sites and different social relations. These accounts look at the narrators as well as their experience in the social context of their everyday lives, give specificity and detail to events, and invite the narrator to carefully qualify subtle experiences of racism. Immigrants are deeply sensitive to negative images that construct them as the other to that which is defined as Canadian. Such representation, Stuart Hall notes, produce meanings that are central to the construction of identity and the marking of difference in production and consumption as well as the regulation of social conduct. Such representations further alienate